Hey, all right, we're recording now. So welcome to our class. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week uh, and finish up chapter three. Uh, and then we have next week, we'll go to chapter four. We're going to have, which goes more into the later New Testament, primarily the Apostle Paul. Well, that'll be two classes as well, because the first part of that chapter looks at things leading up to Paul writing Romans 8. Then the second part, he spends entirely on Romans 8, which I preached about, which I preached on about three, four months, three or four weeks ago. Um, and it's a really significant, significant chapter in his view of Romans 8, which completely changes the view, traditional view, that we've had for 2,000 years. So it's quite interesting. Um, and um, so, so uh, we'll get into that. So if you'd like, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we will dive in, okay? Let's pray. Lord, it's good to be here this day, to be here with you, to continue our study of N.T. Wright's book, to navigate this pandemic, to lift our voices in lamentation for those who are suffering, and in prayer and in trust. Be with us, Lord, that we can weep with those who weep, that we can help to heal those who need healing, that we can comfort those who seek comforting, that we can do the things you call us to do in the kingdom of God, which is in the here and the now. So Lord, we lift this up to you and thank you for giving us this class and being together through this medium. In your holy and gracious name, we make this prayer. Amen. All right, I left off last week, if you want to turn in your book, or you know, if you have your book, on page 24. And we were looking at Matthew 28, 18. I'm going to go back and share the screen a little bit. Um, uh, in fact, what I want to do real quick is review. You don't have to look. I'll, do, I'll look for you. But review very quickly where he took us in Jesus and the Gospels. Well, he starts with talking about, you know, Jesus could read. We talked about the sign of the times. Jesus could read the sign of the times. His prophetic declarations, such as the fact Jerusalem will fall, weren't based on mis magic or mysticism, but just simply the obvious things that were coming. So when we look at the pandemic, he said, if we try to apply any type of mystical elements to the pandemic, it was obvious this was going to happen. And it's obvious it's going to happen again. So, so you know, he talks about, you know, what are we doing now? What are we doing now? Uh, in other words, that, that we are not to be looking backwards, nor necessarily forwards. But as Christians, the kingdom of God is in the present. Uh, so let's, and then he talked about, um, the, uh, you know, uh, are we, you know, when he does talk about wars, famines, earthquakes, and the like, Jesus doesn't say, so when these things happen, you must think carefully about what you and your society should be re repenting of. Uh, being kingdom people, who we are, and being penitence people comes with the territory, wherever we are, whatever is happening in the world. Um, Let's go on. Uh, and so we shall discover the truth that the letter, when he talked about the letter to the Hebrews, declares when it puts Jesus as the last and greatest of the prophets. God has spoken of old through the prophets, but in these days, God has spoken through his son. And we talk about Jesus, N.T. Wright does, as being the last word of God to the world. The last word. There won't, you know, any words that God has to say are going to be through Jesus, which we, you know, through the, through the power of the Spirit, we are constantly reclaiming those words and re, re-declaring them. Jesus is re-declaring them through us, through the Spirit, to meet whatever needs we are at. But there's not going to be a new word coming in, you know. There's not going to be another Messiah there's not going to be a sudden discovery of something new. Jesus is, according to Hebrews, is the last word. 
And then he gets into the issue of sovereignty. What does sovereignty mean? The sovereignty of God, what does it look like? And the sovereignty of God looks like Jesus. So when we try to look back to God making some kind of sovereign move through the pandemic, we have to realize that what is sovereignty to God is not sovereignty to humanity. We think of sovereignty in terms of boundaries, power, thrones, uh, governments, uh, 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 war, military might, glory, those type of things. What is sovereignty to God is the cross. That is what, how God totally redefined sovereignty through Christ. Um, he says, unless we are prepared to see these events, the Jesus events, the messianic moment, as the ultimate call to penitence, because they are the ultimate announcement of the arrival of God's kingdom, we will be bound to overinterpret other events to compensate. Um, um, so Jesus said, don't, you know, Jesus said when he was questioned about the end of time, what will it look like? What are the signs? He said in Luke 17, and we looked at the passage, he said, do not say, look here or look there. That's not going to be, you know, people will come and say that, but that's not going to be the end. <clears throat> the, the end. I, I, he says, I don't know when the end is. At that time, he said that. Um, um, so, so at the bottom of page 21, uh, uh, N.T. Wright says, trying to jump from an earthquake, a tsunami, a pandemic, or anything else to a conclusion about what God is saying here without going through the gospel story is to make the basic theological mistake of trying to deduce something about God while going behind Jesus's back. And we do that, you know, the church does that all the time. It goes behind Jesus's back and goes, you know, well, the hurricane's coming. Uh, that's a sign, especially we hear that in Pentecostal and evangelical Christian circles. The hurricane is a sign of God's judgment um, uh, or the hurricane is a call to repentance these type of things. And of course, we apply that to the pandemic as well. Um, so, you know, I asked the question, is there any interpretation that we can make of terrible events? Is there any way we can interpret terrible events? And N.T. Wright answers that by saying, yes, through Jesus, through the kingdom of God, which is here <laughs> and present now. You interpret it through your Christian faith. And what does the Christian faith inform us in interpreting terrible events? It doesn't ask the question, why, does it? It asks the question, what can we do in response to these events? What can we do where the hurricane came in on the coast of Louisiana and went on up? What can we do? What can we do to those who are suffering from the pandemic? So N.T. Wright sees these things as a call to action, a call to action. Then Doug asked a very good question, an excellent question about other people in the world. And I wanted to point out what N.T. Wright quotes on page 23. Um, um, God's kingdom on earth is in heaven, comes not through wars, earthquakes, famines, or plagues, or domestic accidents. They come through Jesus, through the story of Jesus himself, told, preached, announced, through the people of Jesus, the people in whose lives Jesus himself lives by his spirit. And then, Doug, here's where we answer your question. Through the strange work of Jesus, even in parts of the world where his name is not recognized. Uh, uh, the, what we call the strange work of Jesus. That's what N.T. Wright calls it. The <clears throat> mystery part, which we don't know what that work is, but we know it's happening. I mean, I mean, we, it is work that looks like our work that we do in the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean that Jesus isn't a part of that work there but it can be done in anyone's name for that matter. The work itself 
is, is a part of the kingdom of God. And I don't think Jesus really cares how that work gets done because it is a part of the kingdom of God. And it is the work that is called to do. Um, as as N.T. Wright says on page 23, Jesus' announcement of God's kingdom is the gold standard. The gold standard of way life existence for humanity is going to be from now on. So we no longer ask how or why when we comes to these shattering events. The only thing we ask is how can we respond? That's what he's trying to get at. That's what he means when he talks about being in the here and now. So now we pick up where we left off last week on page 24. And I'm going to go back and look at, we're going to look at together. Let me share my screen. And we're going to look at, um, um, if I can get there. All right. We're going to look at, uh, all right. We're going to look at what I think is an absolutely important and shattering um, passage. And I talked about it a little bit last week. <clears throat> that comes from Matthew 28, 18. This is kind of where we, we left off. Okay. Uh, read it again. Let's read it again. Would someone read the commissioning of the disciples? Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. And, and we talked about last week the age. First, we started with the age. What is he talking about, the age? Well, the age is the age we're in, the age of the kingdom of God. We no longer, as believers, define life the way that Others in the world define it. Life for us is eternal because we believe in Christ. We simply transition from the physical to the spiritual after we die. So, so we are in experiencing the kingdom of God now. This is what we do as the church. We are in that age. And the good news about this passage is we're not alone. We're not alone. We have the church, the fellowship of the church, and we have Christ through the Spirit who is with us. Um, but what I wanted to focus on, which I focused on last week, is the word authority. And this is really important. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I talked about, if you recall, how before when Jesus was asked, how will the world end? How will God bring about the end of the world? Jesus said, I don't know. I have no idea how God will do that. I don't know the time. They wanted to know the time. It was a time when people were caught up in all kinds of apocalyptic fantasies and apocalyptic studies of the prophets and all this kind of thing, as many are today. And so, so, and so what happens is he comes back and something has changed. He comes back from the dead, from the grave. He gathers his disciples. This is the last passage uh, in Matthew. Uh, and something has changed. And it is Jesus now saying, I have the authority. It's been given to me. I determine what happens now through, in all things. And, and as I said, he doesn't say, okay, here's judgment. Here's judgment. He doesn't even declare repentance, does he? He doesn't declare the world is going to have to repent because in 10 years, I'm going to wipe everybody out. It's over. He says, he says, what is the sign of his authority? 
It's in verse 19. What is the sign of his authority? How are we to exercise Jesus's authority? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What does it mean to make disciples of all nations? How is that done? What does it mean? Let's go back to the first century church, the second century church. How is it that so many people flooded into the church from all backgrounds in the first several centuries of the church's existence? They came in from everywhere, from Judaism, from the pagan, from the pagan beliefs, from Roman and Greek beliefs. How did that happen? How did that happen? Because of the disciples' actions. The very good, very good. And what were the disciples' <laughs> actions? Taking care of each other and, and others. Not just taking care of each other. I mean, people in the first century world took care of each other in their little confined groups to the exclusion of everyone else. They took care of each other. The household. They were spreading the word. They were spreading the word. And they were spreading it, not only by declaring it, but by living it. Correct. And those people who had never seen anything like this before were profoundly attracted to it. Profoundly attracted to it. I mean, yes, it was the work of the Spirit, of course. But there was something else going on, too. I mean, the, the authorities, the upper class, the equestrians in the Roman culture were very attracted to Christianity, you know, by what they saw Christianity doing. Um, you had Nero, you had the persecutions, but they were, those were governmental actions against, against their, they, they were trying, Romans were trying to protect the religion of the emperor and all that. In a, in a, in a, in a time when, emperor, the whole concept of the emperor was being challenged and dying and so forth. Uh, you know, Rome was on the downward slope. Uh, so, so what people saw was this astonishing, they saw the kingdom of God and they wanted to be a part of it. That's what they saw, the kingdom of God, and they wanted to be a part of it. Um, um, so, we are in the age of Jesus's authority. We talk about the age of the spirit. We're in the age of Jesus's authority. And when these events happen, all we've got to do is be the church, according to N.T. Wright. We don't have to take these events and interpret them in some theological way. We have to do that. All we have to do is <clears throat> respond to the suffering that these events create, and they create great suffering, don't they? What's one of the great challenges for us as Christians in responding to the pandemic? There are some unique challenges that don't affect us in regards to responding to other events in the world. What are some of the unique challenges we have as a church in responding to the pandemic? Well, we can't meet together. Can't meet together. We can't get close to people to help them. Yeah, I mean, discipleship usually requires us going into places mm -hmm. to do things, right? I mean, you don't, you don't, it's hard to do, you can do discipleship on Zoom, but it's hard to do. <clears throat> so, so that's one of the struggles. I think that's one of the most discouraging parts <clears throat> of this the pandemic. Fact is, Matt, Go ahead, Jim. Uh, Go ahead. By by getting us together on Zoom, even though we're small, um, you, you, you're doing everything you can as a church by filming the, the services and even the friendship later. You're trying to keep the congregation of our church as one, even, and then it's very difficult. I admit very that. Difficult. Very but, difficult. Very difficult. You're trying to do what needs to be done. And let me add, what we're used to doing as Christians in the church is responding to suffering so that when someone says, so-and-so needs this, or so-and-so, da-da-da, 
you know, you can't do pastoral visitation right now. You can do pastoral counseling over Zoom or something like that. We are all pastors. All of us are ministers. But we're used to ministering in certain contexts. And this is challenging the usual context of ministry. So it is temporary. It will go away. But sometimes I feel like we're losing something in the in-between time. Maybe not, but sometimes I just get that feeling. I mean, I think one of the great aspects of suffering in the, in the pandemic is loneliness. I hear it all the time. I experience it. Amy and I experience that, loneliness. So, so and, and that's really hard to, to minister to via, you know, technology. That's the one where you want to sit down with people or invite people to come in. I mean, when people come into church, they're not lonely. They're together, you know. And right now it is so hard for people. And so this is where we get to the next part. And it's a very important part. And the final part of the chapter. And it is the story of, um, it's the story of, let me uh, open this up. There we go. There we go. Uh, let me get more everybody in here. There we go. Come on in, everybody. Come on in. All right. Um, can I resize them? There we go. Okay, hang on. There we go. There we all are. Okay. So it's, it's the story of the raising of Lazarus, which for N.T. Wright is an extremely important story. Okay. I'm just seeing your home screen. Are we supposed to be seeing something besides your home screen? I haven't. I have. Uh, what are you seeing? Just your home screen. Your desktop, not, exactly. Yeah, folders. Yeah, we're not. We, we haven't put. I hadn't put the verses up yet, and I will oh, put okay. the verses up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, oh, you're not seeing us, right? Hang on. Let me stop sharing real quick. Okay. There. Now we're here. There we are. There we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. So this is how he closes the Jesus in the Gospels. And it's very, very important uh, for N.T. Wright. So what I'm going to do, I think, is simply read the story. Read the story. Um, um, and and we'll go back to sharing again, and I'll put it up. All right. Uh, and uh, go away there. Let me find it. There it is. All right. Uh, from, oh, did I not do the story? I thought I did the story. Okay. Well, guess Maybe what? Guess what? Your... I got a Bible. I happen to Maybe have a underneath, <laughs> underneath our pictures there. Because uh, your home screen is covered by... Well, I see, no, no, I see it, but I've only got John 11, and I don't think John 11 is the raising. Oh, yeah, it is. Good. Well, good. Here it is. Can everybody see John 11? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Everyone can see John 11. Good. So, so let's read. Let, I'm going to read it, and let's just follow along, okay? Everybody can see it, right? Yes. Okay. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she set, went and met him while Martha stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, I'm sorry, while well, Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. There's that echo of the apocalypse. Martha said to him, I know on the last day, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection in the life. See, that whole change there, that I am statement, which is very characteristic of John's gospel and only John's gospel. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. 
do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw <laughs> Mary get up quickly and go out. And you don't leave sheep. When you're sitting Shiva, you don't leave it. By the way, that's a, note, a side note. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew, I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Okay. So, so um, on page 26, this is where N.T. Wright begins to talk about this, this. And he begins with what happens before the story begins. Because you remember, that word came to him while he was traveling with the disciples that Lazarus was sick and he needed to come and do something about it. And so he, he's, he, as he's going to Lazarus, his house, he stops and he heals the woman who has the uh, bleeding, the bleeding, who grabs his robe, touches the hem of his garment, and he calls her for it. And, and says, you know, you are healed for your faith. And then as he begins to go on, word comes to him that Lazarus has died. And Jesus says, Lazarus has died, you know, uh, for the sake, uh, uh, for, uh, for, I forget to say it exactly, but that you may see the works of God. That you may see the works of God. That's why he's died. So, N.T. Wright points out that Jesus is fully confident. He knows what he's going to do, and he knows why he's going to do it. He's fully confident. Now, that's where he kind of picks up on page 26. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit of what he says, and I think it's kind of, kind of pretty cool. He makes some points that I never thought of before. Um, when eventually, G I'm looking at the paragraph, first paragraph there on page 26, when eventually Jesus gives the command to take away the stone from the tomb so that he can call Lazarus out and back to life, the first thing he does is pray with thanksgiving that God had heard his prayer. This must mean that before journeying to Bethany, Jesus had prayed that Lazarus, though dead, would not decompose and would be ready to be raised back to life. So Jesus knows that the road is now clear. He remains sovereign through all this. Sovereign is knowing what is going on, what it will cost the family to go through this terrible moment, and what he will then do. This is a part of the dark mystery which John is unveiling. 
the mystery in which Jesus himself will shortly go down into death in order to overthrow the ruler of this world. Does anyone remember liturgically how we express the word mystery uh, liturgically in our church? Do you remember where we do that, anyone? I don't. This is, a, this is not a trick question, but... And then communion. 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 We say, say, uh, we have set aside these elements for this use and mystery. Because there is that spiritual union that happens in the moment between us and God and the Lord as we sit at Christ's table and take communion. And that's the mystery. And this is what? N.T. Wright's talking about. And then he says this wonderful thing at the end of that paragraph, and I love it. Never thought of this. Note that Lazarus comes out of the tomb still wrapped up in the grave clothes. Jesus, in John 20, leaves his grave clothes behind. Why do you think that difference is there? Why? <clears throat> what does that mean? That Lazarus comes out in the grave clothes but that Jesus comes out without having the grave clothes. Does it mean anything at all, do you think? Well, Lazarus isn't being coming out into a new life. He's coming out to take up his old life. Very good. And what's going to happen to Lazarus in the future? What's going to happen? Uh, he's going to die eventually. He's going to die he'll again. Die. Yeah, he'll he's going to die again. Mm -hmm. That the He's not raised eternally. He's going to die again. So the grave clothes are a preview of the ones he's going to wear again at some point. Lazarus's resurrection was not eternal. And so, so to me, that ties in directly to what Jesus does at the tomb. If you look on page 27, uh, it... it, it Jesus points out that Jesus' weeping was real. His grieving was real. His lamentation was not a stage show, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. It says in the middle of that paragraph on page 27, especially for the Lord of life, and the tears of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus point on to, now my soul is troubled, to Mark's and Matthew's description of Jesus in Gethsemane, and to the awful, my God, why did you abandon me on the cross itself? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which comes from lamentations. It comes from lamentations. Um, so, so we go down the next paragraph. Uh, Martha and Mary and then the bystanders both say in effect that it's Jesus' fault. He could have done something to stop this. Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Couldn't he have done something? Asked the crowd. The question echoes down the years with every new tragedy. Why did God allow this? Why didn't God step in and stop this? How do we answer that question? How do we answer that question? Why hasn't God stepped in and just stopped all the misery of this pandemic? I don't know. <laughs> What's the answer? I said, I don't know. It's the same reason he doesn't, you know, let babies, that. he lets babies die and he doesn't let babies die of cancer and things like that. It's like, we don't know. <laughs> what would yeah. it be? Oh, good, good. I mean, that is the, that's our answer. What does what would N.T. Wright say? Think again about the kingdom of God. Well, it makes life meaningful as a part of the kingdom. You have you have something to do. What he would say is he did do something about it. Yeah, exactly. He did yeah. do something. But he about told it. us to do something. He gave us yes. a job to do. And well, who told us to do something? Who did? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he did that at in when he was resurrected to eternal life, when he had shed the grave clothes forever. That's when he said, go out and do something 
now. That's the change that has happened. Uh, you know, the world is no longer the same. Eternal life begins now. And it is your task to show that eternal life begins now. God did stop it. He did. And, and through the sinning of Christ. And that's why he says, and he writes, we can't go behind Christ back and ask God, why have you not stopped this? You're going behind Christ back. I mean, suffering on the cross was an ultimate suffering for Jesus. And so God did stop it. It's just our perspective of thinking past and future rather than in the now and going, he did stop it. And what we have left is to help those who are suffering and hope that when we suffer, we are helped as well. That help comes to us. Has anyone ever helped you in the midst of suffering or have you ever helped anyone in the midst of their suffering? And how did you do it? Well, I know you have because I've seen it. I do remember a friend um, whose husband had just left her or just said he was divorcing her. Yeah. And anyway, I went over and visited and just kind of sat there and talked to her. Very good. Anyone else? So the work we did. <clears throat> Through Doug and Betty, the work we did uh, with the refugees. There you go. Um, yeah. and, and I was a small, very small part, but they led that, and that was a huge uh, I mean, doing something with people who are suffering. Yeah, I mean, and there's God doing something through the people of God, through the people of God. And that concept of God acting to the people of God, the concept that we are in partnership with God did not exist before Christ. It just didn't exist. In Israel, they looked to God for everything. And when God gave it to them, God was upset about it. If you think about the Exodus, you know, God did it as a concession to Moses to protect Moses. God did these things usually to protect the prophets or to, 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 to sustain Israel. But in Jesus, God has given the final word. You know, it's always like I, uh, people ask, what, why doesn't God do more? And here's my answer, and I take it from a, you take it from a family perspective. I gave you my son. What more do you want? What more do you want? But in Deuteronomy, I mean, in the law, wasn't it that they were supposed to take care of the widow and the orphan? I mean, a lot of that comes from the Old Testament, doesn't it? It comes from their re religion. It comes from their religion, yes. It, and, and remember, you have the Ten Commandments, and then you have the, um, uh, 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 the, um, um, the, the, the laws around that. And when I say it comes from my religion... They, they uh, in fact, I'm going to preach about this today. That throughout Israel, there were two point, points of view of what was how God was good struggling with each other. There was the cultic point of view, the temple, the priest. They were the ones saying, you know, you need to give to the poor, you need to help the widow and the orphan. And it was through the temple that they did that. The prophets never said that. Never. The prophets said, get right with God. The prophets said, the Messiah is coming. And God's going to change everything. They did not preach cultic laws. Never. In fact, the priest, in, throughout the Old Testament, we see confrontations between the prophet and the priest, the greatest one being Elijah. Well, they were the priests of Baal. They were the priests of the pagans. But it was, a lot, you know, we see the prophets constantly confronting the cultic religion, whether it's Israel's or the pagans. And, and why was Jesus crucified? He confronted the cultic religion of the Jerusalem temple and the high priest. They're the ones that killed him. And when they did that, that wasn't exactly, you know, 
a charitable act, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got these two strains of how God is good fighting with each other in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus resolves all that in his death and resurrection. It's resolved, you know. So, so you know, it, 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 he is the conclusion of the prophets. Um, so uh, uh, let me go on then. Um, yeah, why did, why did God allow this? Why didn't God step in and stop it? God did. That's what the prophets were saying. There's going to be a change. Um, the God who John, down at the bottom of the page 27, the God who John has told us became incarnate in and as Jesus of Nazareth is the God, the Word made flesh. God weeps at the tomb of his friend. What does it mean to us if we take the incarnation seriously? Which some people really still struggle with, by the way. What does it mean that God weeps? What does that mean that God weeps? How, how do we view, how do you hear that? What do you hear in that, that God weeps? Sad and all the things that people do or don't do. Say it again, Betty, I couldn't hear you. Oh, I said he's sad because of all the things that either people do or don't do that are at, and carry that out, that God weeps. What else does God, God do if God weeps? He, he understands I, us. He's, he understands. Good. He understands, he understands us. And, and what else? What else? And has empathy. He has empathy. He weeps. God weeps. What else, what else does God do? I mean, if we're right, created so in the image of God, God feels every emotion that we feel. Just as Jesus did. He feel, God feels every emotion that we feel. All of them. And, and God grieves for things on this earth, for the pandemic, as much as we do. As much as we do. God grieves. So, again, we go back to the question, well, if God grieves and weeps, why didn't God just stop it? Why? Why didn't God just stop it? And the answer is, for we who believe in Christ, God did stop it. There was the stopping. Lazarus had to die again. Lazarus was going to get sick again. Lazarus was going to suffer more. God, I mean, Jesus stopped his death. But it didn't do him any good. And that is why I think one of the reasons, and this is my interpretation of that story, one of my interpretations, why Jesus weeps. Why Jesus understands why he's got to go to the cross, why he's got to suffer that way. Because he knows he's raised Lazarus, but he knows Lazarus is going to die again unless he goes to the cross. So he weeps for, for Lazarus and he weeps for what he has to do. He weeps in the garden. His, his, his human part, our part, he's fully human, fully divine, does not want to be nailed to a cross, right? He weeps. But that's what God sent him to do, okay? Um, so, in conclusion, on page 28, he comes to two conclusions, and I want to kind of close this up on the two conclusions. First, we learn, we learn it says we leaned, but we learn how Jesus redefines what it means to say that God is in control, that God is taking charge, what it means that God is sovereign. It's not defined the way the earth defines sovereignty or people do upon the earth. Second, as Jesus brings to a peak the Old Testament prophetic tradition, so he rounds it off by drawing the full significance of it all onto himself and his forthcoming death and resurrection. In the normal course of events, we should assume that the sign par excellence of all that the one God has done, is doing, and will do is Jesus himself. Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. Jesus crucified, risen, ascending, ascended, promising to return in glory. Jesus, the true Lord of the world. 
Pandemic, I, I added a note here. Pandemics and wars and famines are not abnormal in the world. They're just not. They may be abnormal to our experience from a personal way, but they are not abnormal to the world. Nothing is new here. As the preacher Ecclesiastes said, nothing is new under the sun. The only new thing that God did was send Christ so that we have a perspective, the kingdom, that is our key, not only perspective, a life that we can do something about it. Up until then, I mean, people, people would help before then, but the help was limited to certain circles, be it their families, be it their kind, be it their nationality. There wasn't this concept of every human being is worthy of being loved. That didn't exist until Jesus came. And that's what the church declared. So you see what a dramatic different point of view that is than from saying this pandemic is a call to repentance, this pandemic is a judgment, this pandemic is God being unable to do anything about it. It just disproves God. No, that's true. All right, let's stop. Are there any questions before we move on to the next chapter? Okay, let's uh, have a word of prayer that I'm going to run in and get going and get practicing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for being with us and for helping us to continue to wrestle with and understand through N.T. Wright and through your spirit how we can approach this pandemic, what we can do, Lord, as you call us to do. Be with us now as we part. Keep us safe through the week until we gather again. In your holy name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. See you next week. Thank you, Mac. Sure. Take care.